Hey everyone, God bless you and thanks a lot for tuning in on this celebration of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I have prepared a short reflection uh, on his life that I hope will be edifying for you. Our nation here in the United States has a number, I think about 11 uh, federal holidays, national holidays. Uh, the greatest, uh, in my opinion, is the holiday of Thanksgiving in November each year. But we also have marvelous other holidays like uh, the celebration of George Washington's birthday, sometimes called President's Day in February. Yeah, that's not its proper title, and it's never been turned from a celebration of the birthday of George Washington, the greatest American, uh, to uh, a universal President's Day, even though Abraham, President Abraham Lincoln's birthday is uh, so close to George Washington's. Washington born on the 11th of February, I think in 1731, and uh, President Abraham Lincoln on the 12th of February in 1809. We also have, uh, since uh, 1983, uh, a national holiday in honor of Martin Luther King. And <clears throat> Martin Luther King is a great American uh, someone of exceptional importance, a true gift from God to uh, our land. And I'd like to share a little bit uh, on this uh, national holiday, uh, a little bit in honor of uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This year, um, MLK Day, which is always the third Monday of January, will be on the 15th um, of January, which is his actual birthday. He was born on the January the 15th, 1929. He was assassinated at 39 years of age uh, on the 4th of April, 1968, at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. Forgive me, I, whoo, what a week it's been. After celebrating Theophany, I was just completely uh, physically decimated. That's not the best way I can describe it. And I still have, a, <coughs> after a week of misery, still have a little illness. I deeply respect uh, Dr. King uh, for many, many reasons, uh, and I'd like to simply mention some of those reasons uh, so that you can know who he is. Uh, if you're not an American, Martin Luther King is still uh, an international figure. He was an, an, a very influential international figure uh, during his earthly life. He, he won the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, he visited many lands and was engaged in uh, preaching uh, in many places throughout the globe. Um, so <clears throat> he's truly an international figure. Let me mention some of the major contributions I think Dr. King made to our land. Uh, the first reason that I consider him to be such a respectable personage uh, and someone worthy of study and admiration is his incredible prophetic witness uh, to the powerful, uh, to the tyrannical. He was a Baptist uh, minister. He always considered this his fundamental identity, uh, a human being, a Christian, a Baptist preacher. And he carried on a uh, an American tradition, but it's not just an American tradition. Anyone who knows the, the tradition of the church, who knows Holy Orthodoxy, knows that um, that the, the prophetic, the priests, the bishops, the monks, have always borne witness, faithful witness for the truth and against tyranny uh, and against power. Uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of historical cases that can be marshaled to make this point. Uh, but it's not possible to be uh, a priest or a bishop faithfully and confine the message of the truth just uh, to the four walls of your church uh, and to live uh, in the midst of tyranny or oppression and not speak. Um, we're, I'm giving this uh, talk shortly after celebrating the Feast of St. John the Baptist. <laughs> Case in point, not much more needing to be said. But Dr. King was an incredible uh, prophetic witness to the powerful uh, against uh, tyranny, against godlessness and human oppression. He also bore witness against his fellow clergy. 
He was very courageous, a very humble man. He didn't do it in a proud way. <coughs> but he, he blamed uh, so much of the social evils uh, facing America, not just on the, uh, the tyranny of the powerful but, and uh, the prejudices of the powerful, but also on the, what he called, silent pulpits, uh, the cowardice that uh, filled so many pastors' hearts. He also, uh, in his witness against the powerful, he, he spoke a lot and against the idea that was so capitalized by the tyrants of uh, this, this false notion amongst sleeping Christians and sleeping pastors on what he called the myth of time. He, he despised this so-called myth of time. These are his words. Uh, this comes from uh, the first place he really started to articulate it, which was his early uh, letter uh, to clergymen from the Birmingham jail. These are his words. Strangely, the strangely irrational notion plagues me that there is something in the very flow of time that will inevitably cure all ills. This is a strangely irrational notion, he says, that there is something in the very flow of time that will inevitably cure all ills. So many were pushing back against him, saying, why are you, are you pushing this issue of justice uh, and, and attacking segregation? Don't you know that it's going to work itself out? This is uh, such a common uh, excuse. Uh, I, I've observed it in my short little life, uh, much to my grief, and uh, I'm sure it has plagued humanity since the fall. This idea that we set forth that somehow things are going to get better if you just let it play out. <laughs> he continues, actually... Time is neutral. It can be used either destructively or constructively. I am coming to feel that people of ill will have used time much more effectively than people of goodwill. We will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the vitriolic words and actions of the bad people. Here he's talking about the extreme racists of his time. But for the appalling silence of the good people. We must come to see that human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts and persistent work of men willing to be co-workers with God. This is an exceedingly important a message that he brought to our nation. Um, and <clears throat> it remains, in my opinion, extremely important today. I find it to be one of the greatest evils uh, in my own world uh, of orthodoxy uh, here in North America, I consider this to be one of the greatest evils of all. Oh, all the things that we know are God's will that must be done, must be done. Let me use a very clear example. The orthodox unity of the church in America. Clearly God's will. We are clearly in sin. We have known it and articulated it for decades and decades and decades and have done nothing uh, to accomplish it. As a matter of fact, in my life, we're far far further away uh, from unity than we have ever been. And yet there's always this assumption, oh, it's just going to work itself out. If I had a dollar for every time some priest or bishop has told me that, oh, it's going to work out itself in time. Uh, that is just pure excuse. And it's a repetition of the myth of time that Dr. King addressed over and over during his life. So this is number one <coughs> reason I respect him so much is his incredible witness, his prophetic witness to the powerful and also to the sleepers. Number two, his public opposition to the evils of segregation in the Deep South and throughout our land. Most people who are in the United States who are 50 years or, or younger have no idea the incredible filth of racism uh, that was still gripping our nation. Uh, of course, yes, that we had fought the Civil War in, in the mid-19th century. There had been this hopeful period of reconstruction, but then we had settled into this horrid reality of segregation, especially in the Deep South. 
where uh, black people were treated absolutely as second-class citizens. Uh, very few of them were enabled to vote. Uh, there were all sorts of uh, false roadblocks placed between uh, the black person and the ability to vote. Uh, they were banned from uh, educational institutions, from restaurants, uh, from bathrooms, for goodness sake. They had to, of course, if you know MLK's life at all, it really started over uh, the bus boycott. <coughs> Black people were told to sit certain places. They were constantly being uh, forced into a mode of um, humble um, degradation, being, let, being communicated the clear message that they were second-class citizens, absolutely atrocious. And he raised his voice to the nation against this great evil, pointing out not only that it was a grotesque violation of uh, the law of God, of uh, denial of the fact that the image of God is in all human beings, regardless of the color of their skin, uh, <coughs> but also pointed out how it was inconsistent with America's own founding documents and fundamental commitments. He, of course, ended up losing his life uh, for this very thing. So I honor him for his public opposition to the evils of segregation and uh, to remaining rem racism uh, at the time in our country. He also is uh, most revered for his embrace and teaching of nonviolent resistance. Uh, in a time when there were explosive riots uh, and America was a powder keg, he stood being opposed from all sides. He was being opposed by those members of the black community like Malcolm X, who said that he was a wallflower and was collaborating with some, some type of, um, you know, a collaborator with the whites because uh, he was not willing to return violence with violence. And then, of course, he was criticized by those uh, on the other side who were saying that he was stirring up the country by addressing these evils so consistently and by leading these peaceful uh, riots or, or peaceful protests against the witness of those who wanted to riot. He was a constant uh, criticizer of writing. So his embrace of nonviolent uh, resistance, which was not, he was, he was very articulate. It was not a matter of passivity uh, at all. Uh, it was a matter of uh, being trained to be, to act as a Christian, being trained not to return evil for evil, being trained to make force. He, he, he distinguished force from violence, non violent force and he had four steps that he articulated in his uh, in his detailed training the first was to gather the facts of injustice he studied the facts on the ground he communicated them very clearly the second step was to negotiate to see if the injustice could be remedied without having a public confrontation the third was self purification this was a detailed training that Martin Luther King and his associates offered all who participated uh, in, non, in the acts of uh, nonviolent protest. And by the way, this is not just black people. Very, very many famous uh, uh, whites participated in this. In fact, we Orthodox Christians are all familiar with the cover of Time magazine on which uh, the late Archbishop... Uh, Yakovos stood with Martin Luther King in Selma. These were <coughs> public actions that involved uh, many throughout the whole country. And Martin Luther only led his people in these public protests after detailed training. And what I mean detailed training is he would literally teach people, when you are cursed, what do you do? You don't return curse for curse. You remain silent or you... you say calmly these words. When you are struck, you do not return evil for evil. You overcome evil with good. Love is the force, what he called the soul force that was going to win the day. And this exaltation of loving, nonviolent resistance is absolutely a, a magnificent 
reality. He rooted it in the teachings of the gospel and in the practice of Mahatma Gandhi uh, in the liberation of uh, India from the British Empire. And lastly, direct action. <clears throat> this is another uh, beautiful witness uh, from Martin Luther King. Another reason to love him is because of his exaltation of the reality of the conscience of the human person. He constantly spoke about conscience in explaining why he was involved. He constantly addressed and taught on the notion of conscience as an aspect of the image of God that belongs to all people. And therefore, by appealing to conscience and rejecting the secularist, reductionist view of the human being, which has no conscience and no moral abiding moral law, he constantly talk the, taught the relevance of the eternal abiding moral law of God to which every human being from all in all time is accountable. And he appealed to the conscience of others. He didn't provide any, uh, he, he didn't give any quarter to those who wanted to pretend that conscience was made up. Uh, he simply refused this materialist anthropology and appealed to everyone's heart. Um, another beautiful quality uh, in the teaching example of Martin Luther King is his affirmation of the redeeming quality of voluntary suffering. This may be one of the most precious areas, most important areas to read and understand and imitate uh, Martin Luther King today for Christians today because the concept of human suffering and the value of the voluntary embrace of human suffering is completely neglected today. Uh, there is no uh, public sense uh, of that. That Christian teaching is just gone. And it's something that he modeled and taught extensively. Another reason I love the man is because he uh, was such a mighty, he was a fantastic preacher. By the way, you can see many of his live sermons uh, on YouTube uh, in black and white. Uh, extremely moving preacher. And his... Uh, his explication of our Savior's uh, demand for love for the poor uh, is uh, just marvelous and unparalleled. His, especially his sermons uh, on Lazarus uh, and the rich man and the sin of the rich man uh, being not seeing the poor, just not seeing the poor uh, <coughs> as a as a, as a disposition of life. Absolutely marvelous. Uh, lastly, I, I'd like to say that uh, another reason, of course, I'm just giving you these seven or eight uh, in my, uh, in, the, in the short presentation. There's a lot more that can be said uh, for the virtue of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. His refusal to demonize his enemies throughout his entire life uh, is so marvelous and so beautifully Christians. He, he articulated very, very clearly that there is nothing that his opponents could do to him that would lead him to hate them, and that not only was he committed not to hating them, but that he absolutely loved them and wished their well and sought their good. Even the most egregious uh, racists uh, out, of, out of Alabama, he prayed for and sought their good. This uh, isn't just, uh, wasn't just modeled in his life, this love of enemies, uh, by uh, how he loved the racists. But even his, uh, within, his, within the, the Negro community itself, he had so many opponents, people like Malcolm X, whom he refused to hate, whom he loved, uh, even up to Malcolm's death. Uh, when, when he, at the end of his life, when Martin Luther King moved to Chicago, which was a a radical transition <clears throat> from his life in the Deep South. When he moved to Chicago, uh, there are stories of him moving into the tenements, moving into the housing projects so that he could understand exactly how the people were living. Uh, and his apartment being filled with gangsters until 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the, in the morning. And he would be sitting on the ground on his living room floor talking with them about the necessity of love and how nonviolence in the imitation of Christ is the only way to the dignity of all human beings. Um, absolutely marvelous. Uh, that portion of his life is particularly uh, breathtaking. 
he also um, refused to hate um, those who treated him in the United States government so unjustly. People, people like J. Edgar Hoover uh, and his uh, cronies at the time in the FBI. Wow, doesn't this seem like such an old problem for us uh, with regards to the un-American activities uh, of the FBI, particularly uh, in this last <coughs> decade, but it certainly didn't start there, did it? If you know anything about uh, the horrible accusations that were being made by Hoover uh, against Martin Luther King as though he was a communist, there has never been any evidence of that whatsoever, uh, but they wiretapped him and spied on him and threatened him and uh, who, you know, who knows, perhaps even more. The Coretta, the widow, Coretta King, the widow of uh, the Reverend Martin Luther King, and many who are closest to him have never accepted the official uh, line about uh, how he died uh, and his assassination. But what a man, what a man. You know, we Christians, we love and study the life of our Lord Jesus Christ above everything. Following that, we adore his most pure mother and all of the saints. Uh, but it's also important for us to love our national heroes. And this man is, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., is one of our great Americans. And <clears throat> I would encourage you to, to read, if, if, if a nation is going to uh, pass on its inheritance, if the United States is going to recover its uh, identity, then we have to study the lives uh, of our great Americans, people like George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, and also the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. If you're wondering how to do that, let me make a few suggestions. There is a, a very fine collection uh, of Dr. King's speeches, sermons, and books. Uh, it's in this 700-page volume. Uh, edited by James W. Uh, M. Washington, A Testament of Hope, The Essential Writings and Speeches of Dr. Martin Luther King. Absolute treasure. Uh, if that's a little overwhelming to you or you don't want to, to spend, even though it's, it's really quite cheap as a collection of his testimonies and works, if you want something sm smaller to start, I would suggest this excellent collection of his sermons, Strength to Love. It has a forward, that this edition has a forward by his widow, uh, Credit King, You'll see his heart uh, in his preaching more than anywhere else. It's a fantastic collection uh, of uh, his sermons. And then if you want something larger to kind of understand the background of his life uh, and, and a good biography, uh, I recently read this biography by Jonathan Eag. It's not that big. I think it's about only 600 pages, 650 pages, something like that. King a Life. Uh, and it's a, a very, very well done uh, biography. I intend uh, this week to deliver a lecture or two uh, to my parish uh, on the life of the doctor, of Dr. Martin Luther King and uh, some of his, reading some extension sex, extensive sections from his teachings. Uh, and you might check out that on the Arena Podcast because I'll post uh, that lecture or lectures uh, on the Arena po Podcast soon. As I mentioned, in 1983, uh, the United States uh, codified uh, his birthday as a national holiday. That was done actually by President Ronald Reagan in 1983. And the first celebration of uh, the national holiday of Martin Luther King MLK Day was in 1986, the third Monday of January, as it is each year. So I wish you all uh, a very happy Martin Luther King Day and may his beautiful witness translate uh, into our lives, uh, into imitation of so many of these virtues. God be with you. Patristic Nectar Publications presents The Holy Trinity, an 11 lecture series by the late Father Thomas Hopko, former professor of dogmatic theology and dean of St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary. Revered for his zealous and forthright preaching, Father Hopko delivered these lectures in February 2001 to the clergy of the Antiochian Orthodox Christian Archdiocese of North America. Delving into the Orthodox Church's dogmatic teachings on God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. March 18, 2024, 
marks the ninth anniversary of Father Hopko's repose. May his memory be eternal. For these and other available titles, please visit our website at patristicnectar.org.